More than 30 years at a reception following a literary event uh, very much like this one, I asked my illustrious senior colleague, Carl Shapiro. Shapiro is a major American poet who taught here from 1968 to 1985. In a moment, I must say, of supreme boredom. Um, Carl, who do you think, among young poets in this country, who's got your eye? Shapiro had many great uh, assets, features, but generosity toward younger poets was not among them. And I thought, well, this will be a brief conversation. But he perked up, took his pipe out of his mouth, and said, Ted Couser. And I thought, Ted Couser. And I thought, who the hell's Ted Couser? Uh, it turned out that Carl had taught at the University of Nebraska, where he founded the influential uh, journal uh, Prairie Schooner. And uh, one of his prize uh, students and mentees was a poet named Ted Couser. In the intervening 30 years, Mr. Couser has gone on to win his own distinction, serving as US Poet Laureate from 2004 to 2006. He's been back in civilian life for a little less than a month, he says. And as US Poet Laureate, he made over 200 appearances in two years, uh, most of which were flying out of the airport at Lincoln in Nebraska. He also won the, poet, the uh, Pulitzer Prize for Poetry with Delights and Shadows, uh, published in 2005 by Copper Canyon. Like his teacher, Shapiro had won the uh, Pulitzer for V Letter in 1945 and was one of the early Poets Laureate in 1948. Like T.S. Eliot and Wallace Stevens, Ted Couser turned early to business to support his poetry habit. And like Stevens, he worked in the insurance industry for almost 35 years, working his way up from underwriter to vice president. More centrally during that period, Mr. Couser published more than 20 books, establishing himself first as a poet of plain song from the Great Plains and then a national figure, quickly transcending the merely regional to locate the arresting, poignant, and spiritual in everyday life. As is the case of his predecessor, Billy Collins, Ted Couser has been a champion of accessible poetry. And he has lobbied from his position to return poetry to public discourse. And he's used the instruments of the 21st century to do so. He founded a weekly website distribution service for poetry for small and daily newspapers all over the country. It's called AmericanLifeInPoetry.org. I just read the 86th weekly installment this morning. And he tells me, we were talking just beforehand, that it has been picked up by more than 150 newspapers. And this week, they celebrated their 100th millionth hit, which I only looked at it four times, so obviously a number of you were involved. So it's just like it sounds. The website uh, is AmericanLifeInPoetry.org. Since, po since appointment as Poet Laureate and winning the, the Pulitzer, Ted Couser has gathered well-earned acclaim from major players like National Endowment for the Arts Chair Dana Joya, himself a poet and a tireless, tireless major advocate for a poetry of plain song. Joya wrote recently, Ted Couser has written more perfect poems than any other poet of his generation. There is no poet of equal stature who writes so convincingly in a manner that the average American can understand. He has built his audience and his reputation in a quiet way, but he is one of our most original poets. Read individually, his poems sparkle with insight. Read together, they provide an exceptional portrait of contemporary America. Please welcome Ted Couser. Thank you all for coming. I, when Carl Shapiro was uh, still here at Davis and his um, wife, Terry, was um, in the last months of her life, they invited me out here for reading. I think that must have been 1982 or so. And 
I'm sorry to say I haven't been back to Davis since, but it's nice to be here. Um, I, um, ever, ever, ever since I, my recent ascendancy, and you know, I'm basically an introvert, um, my friends would come to me and say, put their hand on my shoulder and say, how you doing? How you holding up under all this? And is, is uh, how does, how's Kathy doing? Is she doing okay with this? You being gone a lot and so on. So I wrote this poem in answer. It's called Success. I can feel the thick yellow fat of applause building up in my arteries, friends. Yet I go on, a fool for adoration. Do I care that when it sloughs off, it is likely to go straight to the brain? I'm already showing the first signs of poetic aphasia, the words coming hard, the synapses of metaphor no longer connecting. But look at me, down on my knees next to the podium, lapping the last drops, then rolling in the stain like a dog. Getting the smell on my good tweed sport coat, the grease on my suede elbow patches, and for what? Well, for the women I walk past the next morning. <laughs> the ones in the terminal wheeling their luggage, looking so beautifully earnest. All for the hope that they will suddenly dilate their nostrils, squeeze the hard carry-on handles, and rise to the ripening odor of praise with which I have basted myself stinking to heaven. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's always a little, uh, I want to do question and answers after we're done here, so, um, and I hope you'll have some questions for me. Um, there's always some interest in the fact that I went to work for this life insurance company. Like, how do you, how do you work for a life insurance company and write poems and so on? And, um, you know, poets have to have jobs. Um, you, uh, teachers, uh, poets who are teachers on uh, campuses have jobs, and I had a job in the insurance business. Um, I was envious at times of my uh, friends who were teaching and had the whole summer off, but other than that, there were some good things about it. I didn't have to correct papers all night long or do any of that kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to read a couple of um, poems that I wrote over the years. At first, when I went to work for the insurance company, I was 25 years old. I'd been thrown out of graduate school at the University of Nebraska because I was more interested in poetry than the things I was supposed to be doing there. Um, they cut off my assistantship and told me to go home. Um, now I, I've been given an honorary doctorate at the University of Nebraska. <laughs> um, it's funny how those things happen. Carl Shapiro said one time that he'd been thrown out of school at Johns Hopkins and come back a full professor. I remember that. You know? <laughs> anyway, this is the kind of thing I wrote as a, I guess you might say an angry young man at my first insurance job. This poem is now... 40 years old, I guess. They had torn off my face at the office. They had torn off my face at the office. The night that I finally noticed that it was not growing back, I decided to slit my wrists. Nothing ran out. I was empty. Both of my hands fell off shortly thereafter. Now at my job, they allow me to type with the stumps. It pleases them to have helped me and I gain in speed and confidence. Sort of the way it was. <laughs> and then as the years went by and I moved into middle age, becoming more and more mellow, I guess. Uh, this is another one. This, is, uh, this poem would be from probably the mid-1970s. At the office early. Rain has beaded the panes in my office windows, and in each little lens, the bank at the corner hangs upside down. What wonderful music this rain must have made in the night, a thousand banks turned over, the change crashing out of the drawers and bounding upstairs to the roof, the soft percussion of ferns dropping out of their pots, the ballpoint pens popping out of their sockets in a fluffy snow of deposit slips. 
Now all day long as the sun dries the glass, I'll hear the soft piano of banks writing themselves, the underpaid tellers counting their nickels and dimes. And then finally, this is, uh, I retired when I was 60. Um, I got quite seriously ill and uh, took an early retirement. Uh, but this poem was written in the last year that I was there. Uh, and it, this one is in Delights and Shadows. Four secretaries. All through the day, I hear or overhear their clear, light voices calling from desk to desk. Young women whose fingers play casually over their documents, setting the incoming checks to one side, the thick computer reports to the other, tapping the correspondence into stacks while they sing to each other, not intending to sing, nor knowing how beautiful their voices are as they call back and forth, singing their troubled marriage ballads, their daycare, car park, landlord songs. Even their anger with one another is lovely, the color rising in their throats, their white fists clenched in their laps, the quiet between them that follows. And their sadness, how deep and full of love is their sadness, when one among them is hurt, and they hear her calling and gather about her to cry. I, um, I, like, uh, I like poems, uh, like to write poems in which I am not present. I like to be looking in at, and looking at things happening and basically just describing them. It's a little group of snapshots in a way. Tattoo. What once was meant to be a statement, a dripping dagger held in the fist of a shuddering heart, is now just a bruise on a bony old shoulder, the spot where vanity once punched him hard and the ache lingered on. He looks like someone you had to reckon with, strong as a stallion, fast and ornery. But on this chilly morning as he walks between the tables at a yard sale, with the sleeves of his tight black t-shirt rolled up to show us who he was, he is only another old man, picking up broken tools and putting them back, his heart gone soft and blue with stories. And another of those. A rainy morning, a young woman in a wheelchair wearing a black nylon poncho spattered with rain is pushing herself through the morning. You have seen how pianists sometimes bend forward to strike the keys, then lift their hands, draw back to rest, then lean again to strike just as the chord fades. Such is the way this woman strikes at the wheels, then lifts her long white fingers, letting them float then bends again to strike, just as the chair slows, as if into a silence. So expertly she plays the chords of this difficult music she has mastered, her wet face beautiful in its concentration, while the wind turns the pages of rain. Um, back in the, this would have happened even more in California, I think, than back where I live, but back in the, uh, late 60s and 70s, when everyone had very long straight hair, when they walked, they walked like this. <laughs> so every once in a while you'll see people still doing that. <laughs> and, and I've been watching students on the campus of the University of Nebraska and elsewhere with backpacks on, heavy backpacks, and they do this. This is the way they walk, sort of pawing at the air. And one morning, I have an office on the second floor of a of a building on the University of Nebraska campus, and I saw this young man in a turtle green nylon backpack walking across campus. Student. The green shell of his backpack makes him lean into wave after wave of responsibility, and he swings his stiff arms and cupped hands paddling ahead. He's extended his neck to its full length, and his chin, hard as a beak, breaks the cold surf. He's got his baseball cap on backward as up he crawls out of the froth of a hangover and onto the sand of the future and lumbers heavy with hope into the library. <laughs> <clears throat> if 
for the past 21 years, I have written an annual Valentine poem. Um, I, um, they're not traditional Valentines at all, but they, they go to the subject of love in general, or they have a heart in them somewhere, that sort of thing. Um, and I've had great fun with this. I started by sending them to the wives of my friends, um, and, <laughs> and, have, and have been expanding this list ever since. Um, and so I, I'm going to read one of those Valentines uh, tonight. And if there are women in this audience who would like to be on my Valentine list, all you have to do is give me a little slip of paper with your mailing address. Not, no, I don't do this by email. These actually come with a stamp on them. So if you'd like to be a part of my list, uh, you'll, be, you'll be among around 2,400 right now. I think there are. You know, a... Anyway, this is very typical, very typical of the kind of thing I've done with these Valentines. Splitting an order. I like to watch an old man cutting a sandwich in half. Maybe an ordinary cold roast beef on whole wheat bread, no pickles or onion. Keeping his shaky hands steady by placing his forearms firm on the edge of the table and using both hands, the left to hold the sandwich in place and the right to cut it surely corner to corner. Observing his progress through glasses that moments before he wiped with his napkin, and then to see him lift half onto the extra plate that he asked the server to bring, and then to wait, offering the plate to his wife, while she slowly unrolls her napkin and places her spoon, her knife, and her fork in their proper places, then smooths the starched white napkin over her knees and meets his eyes and holds out both old hands to him. Skater, another snapshot. She was all in black, but for a yellow ponytail that trailed from her cap and bright blue gloves that she held out wide, the feathery fingers spread as surely she stepped click-clack onto the frozen top of the world. And there, with a clatter of blades, she began to braid a loose path that broadened into a meadow of curls. Across the ice she swooped, and then turned back, and halfway bent her legs and leapt into the air the way a crane leaps, blue gloves lifting her lightly, and turned a snappy half-turn there in the wind before coming down, arms wide, skating backward right out of that moment, smiling back at the woman she'd been just an instant before. At the cancer clinic, She is being helped toward the open door that leads to the examining rooms by two young women I take to be her sisters. Each bends to the weight of an arm and steps with the straight, tough bearing of courage. At what must seem to be a great distance, a nurse holds the door, smiling and calling encouragement. How patient she is in the crisp white sails of her clothes. The sick woman peers from under her funny knit cap to watch each foot swing, scuffing forward, and take its turn under her weight. There is no restlessness or impatience or anger anywhere in sight. Grace fills the clean mold of this moment, and all the shuffling magazines grow still. My uh, doctor, who's in that clinic, um, I gave him a copy of that poem, and I was greatly honored. He had it blown up and it hangs in the nurse's station back where the nurses uh, work there at, the, at that clinic. I also like to write poems about things. The more ordinary they are, the more fun it is for me to work with them. Um, I've written poems about what the refrigerator sounds like coming on at night and so on. This is a, a short poem about a leaky faucet. All through the night, the leaky faucet searches the stillness of the house with its radar blip. Who is awake? Who lies out there as full of worry as a pan in the sink? Cheer up, cheer up, the little faucet calls. 
someone will help you through your life. And another one about a, a ubiquitous thing, the spiral notebook. The bright wire rolls like a porpoise in and out of the calm blue sea of the cover, or perhaps like a sleeper twisting in and out of his dreams, for it could hold a record of dreams if you wanted to buy it for that, though it seems to be meant for more serious work, with its college-ruled lines and its cover that states in emphatic white letters, Five Subject Notebook. It seems a part of growing old is no longer to have five subjects, each demanding an equal share of attention set apart by brown cardboard dividers, but instead to stand in a drugstore and hang onto one subject a little too long, like this notebook you weigh in your hands, passing your fingers over its surfaces as if it were some kind of wonder. Anybody here um, read the uh, essays of David Quammen? You know David Quammen's essays? He's a marvelous uh, writer about nature. And in one of his essays, I found in one of his books, he identifies a species of moth that lives by drinking tears. Um, what poet could resist that subject? And the title of this poem is, the <clears throat> is actually the name of the species. It's called Lobocraspus grisifusa. This is the tiny moth who lives on tears, who drinks like a deer at the gleaming pool at the edge of the sleeper's eye, the touch of its mouth as light as a cloud's reflection. In your dream, a moonlit figure appears at your bedside and touches your face. He asks if he might share the poor bread of your sorrow. You show him the table. The two of you talk long into the night, but by morning the words are forgotten. You awaken serene in a sunny room, rubbing the dust of his wings from your eyes. <clears throat> I, I uh, read this poem at every one of my readings because I have so much fun with it. It's... Um, it deals with a subject that everyone in this room has experienced, and why, why I like to read it <clears throat> so much, excuse me, is that um, as I read it, I will notice all of you becoming more and more uncomfortable as the poem goes along. Um, but I will, re will release you at the end of the, of the poem. Um, the, one of the things that I've learned about writing poems is that you confine your reader more and more tightly as the poem progressed, and then at the end you let them go. <clears throat> so here it is, the urine specimen. <laughs> In the clinic, a sun-bleached shell of stone on the shore of the city, you enter the last small chamber, a little closet chastened with pearl, cool, white, and glistening, and over the chilly well of the toilet, you trickle your precious sum in a cup. It's as simple as that. But the heat of this gold, your bodies melted and poured out into a form, begins to enthrall you, warming your hand with your flesh's fevers in a terrible way. It's like holding an organ, spleen or fatty pancreas, a lobe from your foamy brain still steaming with worry. You know that just outside, a nurse is waiting to cool it into a gel and slice it onto a microscope slide for the doctor, who in it will read your future, wringing his hands. You lift the chalice and toast the long life of your friend there in the mirror, who wanly smiles but does not drink to you. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the pleasures of doing this sort of thing, going around the country and do, doing readings and talking about poetry is meeting people. And I was, um, 
I did a reading a number of years ago in a little, at a little college in the Philadelphia area, one of the many little colleges in the Philadelphia area. And um, afterwards, I was invited to dinner at the home of a couple. Uh, he was in the English department. And over dinner, it came out that, that the wife was the step-granddaughter of John Cornos. John Cornos was one of the Imagist poets, not very well known today, but he knew everyone in that early modern period. So after dinner, we went in the living room. We're sitting in the living room drinking coffee, and she said, uh, let me show you some things. And she brought out a cardboard box almost as big as the top of this podium, completely full of of correspondence from um, Ezra Pound, Eliot, uh, Stevens, Amy Lowell, calling cards from William Butler Yeats and all these things, a whole cardboard box of these things. And I was completely overwhelmed by it. And I went through them all, you know. And, uh, and then she, she said, and, uh, and you, you're interested in art, aren't you? And I said, well, I, you know, I paint a little bit and I love to look at art. She said, well, this will interest you then. And she took the box and set it aside and went in the other room and came back with a little flat wooden box about this long, about like that, put it on my knees and opened the lid, a box of pastels. I once held on my knees a simple wooden box in which a rainbow lay, dusty and broken. It was a set of pastels that had years before belonged to the painter, Mary Cassatt. And all of the colors she'd used in her work lay open before me. Those hues she'd most used, the peaches and pinks, were worn down to stubs, while the cool colors, violet, ultramarine, had been set scarcely touched to one side. She'd had little patience with darkness, and her heart held only a measure of shadow. I touched the warm dust of those colors, her tools, and left there with light on the tips of my fingers. Somebody someday ought to do a book on, maybe they have, I'm not enough of a scholar to know this, but on Philadelphia and, how, and the connections between American poetry and American painting. Philadelphia, of course, was the real seat of American art for many, many years, and there were a lot of poets that were affiliated in some way with those artists and so on. You've probably seen that famous Charles Sheeler the figure five that is based on the William Carlos William poem and some of those things. There was a lot of connection. Um, you know, there are, um, there are lots of different ways to write poems. Um, and two ways that I work with quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> the, there's the poem in which you take an ordinary thing like that spiral notebook and you, you ornament it with language and you, you build it into something sort of above itself with, with that kind of language. There's also a kind of poem that comes out of direct human experience that really, if you begin to decorate it, if you begin to make that kind of flourishes, make those flourishes, that it, it will not work, that you really need to deliver it right out the way you would, you know, you would tell someone about an experience. And this is, a, this is a poem that is that way. It's stripped of metaphor. It's something to ha that, that actually happened to me as a little boy, and um, I wanted to give it as an example of the other kind of poem. A deck of pornographic playing cards. We were 10 or 11, my friend and I, when we found them up under a bridge on top of a beam where pigeons were resting. Someone had carefully hidden them there. On each was a black and white photo, no two cards alike. We grew quiet and older, young men on our haunches, staring at what we feared might be the future. The pigeons flapped back to their roosts, rustling and cooing. The river gurgled as it slipped from the bridge's cool shadow. There were women with big muzzle dogs, women with bottles and broom handles. Stallions stood over the bodies of others. The women smiled and licked their lips with tongues like thorns. We grew old. We were two old men with stiff legs and sad hearts. We had wanted to laugh, but we couldn't. We had thought we were boys, come there to throw stones at the pigeons, but we were already dying inside. Um, <clears throat> in Nebraska, at the, at 
the University of Nebraska, we have a, a noted landscape painter by the name of Keith Jacob Sagan. Uh, Keith does prairie landscapes that are just marvelous, big canvases, very low horizon, these marvelous open skies. And he and I are very good friends, and um, I have dinner with him frequently, or we do. And one night at a, at a restaurant, he told me this family story and, that I rewrote as a poem. Um, the old man in this poem is Keith's maternal great-grandfather. And the young woman whose body is coming back to Kansas would have been his grandmother's sister. Um, this is a poem that is very much like, you know, our, our Nebraska's greatest author is Willa Cather. And this is, the, the story is very much like a Cather story, I think. It has a kind of cinematic feeling to it. The Beaded Purse. Dressed in his church suit and under the shadow of his hat, the old man stood on the wooden depot platform three feet above the rest of Kansas while the westbound freight chuffed in and hissed to a stop. He and the agent and two men, commercial travelers waiting to go on west, pulled mail bags out of the steam then slid out his daughter's coffin, canvas over wood, and set it on a nearby baggage cart. Not till the train had rolled away and tooted once as it passed the shacks on the leading edge of the distance, and not till the agent had disappeared, dragging the bags of mail behind, did the old man pry up the nailed down lid with a bar he'd brought in the wagon. Hat in hand, he took a long look. He hadn't seen her in a dozen years. At 19, without his blessing, she'd gone back east to be an actress, now and then writing her mother in a carefree, ne'er-do-well cursive to say she was happy, living in style. A week before, the agent sent word that there was a telegram waiting, and the old man and his wife rode the town to read that their daughter had died and her remains were on the way home. Remains, that's how they put it. She was wearing a fancy yellow dress, but was no longer young and pretty. She looked like one of the worn-out dolls she'd left in her room at the farm, where he would sometimes go to sit. A bag of women's private underthings had been stuffed between her feet, and someone had pushed down next to her an evening bag beaded with pearls. He opened the purse and found it empty, so he took a few bills out of his pocket and folded them in then snapped it closed for her mother to find. Then with the back of the bar, he tapped the lid in place and went to find the station agent. The two of them lifted the coffin down and carried it a few hard yards across the sunny, dusty floor of Kansas and loaded it onto the creaking wagon. Then, clapping his hat on his head and slapping the plump rump of his mare with the reins, he started the long haul home with his rich, and famous daughter. Marvelous story, isn't it? There's a poem about the way we use memory in writing. Um, how we, when we begin to write, how the memories flood in and, uh, and then how we transform them and with a kind of prairie theme because it's a tornado metaphor that I'm working with here. Memory. Spinning up dust and corn shucks as it crossed the chalky exhausted fields, it sucked up into its heart hot work, cold work, lunch buckets, good horses, bad horses, their names and the names of mules that were better or worse than the horses then rattled the dented tin sides of the threshing machine, shook the manure spreader, cranked the tractor's crank that broke the uncle's arm, then swept on through the windbreak, taking the treehouse and dirty magazines, turning its fury on the barn, where cows kicked over buckets and the gray cat sat for a squirt of thick milk in its whiskers. Crossed the chicken pen, undid the hook, plucked a warm brown egg from the meanest hen, then turned toward the house, where threshers were having dinner, peeled back the roof and the kitchen ceiling, 
reached down and snatched up uncles and cousins, grandma, grandpa, parents and children one by one, held them like dolls, looked long and longingly into their faces, then set them back in their chairs with blue and white platters of chicken and ham and mashed potatoes still steaming before them with boats of gravy and bowls of peas and three kinds of pie. And suddenly, with a sound like a sigh, drew up the crowded, roaring, dusty funnel. And there at its tip was the nib of a pen. I was, um, as a little boy, I was very taken with my grandmother's generation, the women in that generation. Uh, they, uh, I had a lot of great aunts and so on. I was always fascinated with them and uh, the, w the way, the kind of simple work that they were doing. A jar of buttons. This is a core sample from the floor of the Sea of Mending, a cylinder packed with shells that over many years sank through fathoms of shirts, pearl buttons, blue buttons, and settled together beneath waves of perseverance. An ocean upon which generations of women set forth under the sails of gingham curtains and seated side by side on decks sometimes salted by tears made small but important repairs. I've written a lot about that my family uh, and that generation uh, and the generation of my grandparents and so on. Um, and one of the things we can do, all of us can do as when we're writing about family is that, you know, we get them down on a piece of paper, get these stories down on a piece of paper, and then somebody comes along and picks up that piece of paper and up they come into the light for a little while again and then they subside. So I, this following poem is, is an example of of uh, my trying to keep one of those cousins alive a little bit longer. Um, his name was Ira Friedline. He was a farmer in Clayton County, Iowa, far northeastern Iowa along the Mississippi River. Um, when he was uh, in his late 80s, I heard that he was, uh, as we say back home, that he was failing. Um, I went to see him at the nursing home and he had, he, the I called to make a kind of an appointment in a way, I guess, and they, they got him all dressed up and got him out there in his wheelchair, and he had a brand new plaid shirt, and he had, a, he had developed in old age a tremendously pronounced, very black age spot on one hand that went up into the cuff of the shirt, which appears in this poem. And I wanted to write it so that I could set his name in the poem. A goodbye handshake. Though you in the nursing home are miles behind me now, your hand with its dark blue age spots is here in my hand, your fingers warm from all of the hot steel handles they held in your 88 years, levers of threshing machines, of sickle bar mowers and balers, but cooling now and slowly going all blue black over brown, like a pool of blue oil on the floor of a barn that darkness working its way up into the cuff of your new plaid shirt, up past your elbow, sharp as a plowshare, there on the wheelchair armrest, easing over your heart like a shadow. A hundred miles down the road, stopped by the highway and sitting in shade at the edge of a shimmering cornfield, I say goodbye. I am headed both farther and further than you, Ira Friedline. With love, I take your blue-black hand, which has held nearly everything once and has squeezed it shyly and politely. <clears throat> that generation, the generation of my mother, um, you know, went through the Depression, and many of you have, have had experiences with people that went through that period and how marvelously thrifty they are. Um, one of my favorite stories about mother is that um, she, when she was in her 80s, uh, my dad had been dead for a number of years, and she would go to garage sales and pick up these bags of fabrics, just fabric scraps, and then she'd make these beautiful um, crazy quilts out of them. They weren't real quilts, they were tied comforters, but they had 
crazy quilt tops, all feather stitched. And, and uh, by that time, the family was pretty small, and she'd given one of these to each of the members of the family, and uh, the, the generation of my son and my nephew, and so or my, yeah, my nephew. And um, so one day I called up just to check up on her, and she said, I finished another one of these quilts, Ted, and I have no one to whom to give it. Uh, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, Mother, what do you have in that quilt? She said, $12.43. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, well, what if you put a price on it like $75 or $100, and I'll just buy it from you? And she said, why, why would you do that? And I said, well, I had a, f a former girlfriend from between my two marriages, and she got married about a year ago, and I didn't give her a wedding present, and something like this would make a really nice wedding present. And without a breath of, of pause, she said, Ted, that's too much to give to an old girlfriend. <laughs> that was just the way it was, you know. Uh, yeah. And here's one, of, this is one of those women from that generation, Aunt Mildred. After she'd cooked and then eaten the meat, she washed and rinsed the butcher paper under a pitcher pump that drew red water up from a cistern under the house, rain speckled with dirt from the cedar shingles, then put the paper out on the line to dry, using old clothespins whitened by lye, the paper pinned next to her under things, which she dried inside her pillowcases so they couldn't be seen from the street. Then pressed the paper with a hot, sad iron and carefully cut it into little squares, picked up a pencil stub and pinched it hard, straightened her spine, and wrote a small but generous letter to the world. Um, my, my mother died on March 23, 1998, um, after um, she'd had emphysema and uh, heart trouble, congestive heart failure, and had been in an assisted living center for about five months. In the last few days of her life, she said to my sister one day, the minute I'm gone, get my things out of this room. We're not paying an extra day's rent. <laughs> Just the way she was, you know. Um, and she died on the day the rent was due, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, but anyway, on, on, the, on March 23rd, 1998, and, and she died during the night, and uh, in the morning I decided, I was there, I decided that I would drive up to Guttenberg, Iowa, where she had grown up, or in that area, to tell her best friend, Ruth Craigle, who was in the nursing home, that this had happened, and then also to stop and see her last first cousin. Um, and I'll give you that story in a little bit. But at any rate, here's, here's a poem that I wrote for Mother uh, a month after her death as a sort of letter to her. Mid-April already, and the wild plums bloom at the roadside, a lacy white against the exuberant, jubilant green of new grass and the dusty, fading black of burnt-out ditches. No leaves, not yet, only the delicate, star-petaled blossoms, sweet with their timeless perfume. You have been gone a month today and have missed three rains and one night-long watch for tornadoes. I sat in the cellar from six to eight while fat spring clouds went somersaulting, rumbling east. Then it poured, a storm that walked on legs of lightning, dragging its shaggy belly over the fields. The meadow larks are back and the finches are turning from green to gold. Those same two geese have come to the pond again this year, honking in over the trees and splashing down. They never nest, but stay a week or two, then leave. The peonies are up, the red sprouts burning in circles like birthday candles, for this is the month of my birth, as you know, the best month to be born in, thanks to you. Everything ready to burst with living. There will be no more new flannel nightshirts sewn on your old black singer, no birthday card addressed in a shaky but businesslike hand. You asked me if I would be sad when it happened, and I am sad. But the iris I moved from your house now hold in the dusty, dry fists of their roots 
green knives and forks, as if waiting for dinner, as if spring were a feast. I thank you for that. Were it not for the way you taught me to look at the world, to see the life at play in everything, I would have to be lonely forever. Then on that morning following, uh, I went to see this friend in the nursing home, Ruth Craigle. She said a beautiful thing. She said, um, um, your mother and I were such good friends, Ted, that we could sit together in a, in a room for an hour and neither of us thought we'd have to say a word. Um, then I went another 20 miles over the hill to visit her last first cousin, Pearl Richards. Pearl had uh, been a widow for many years, um, wrote a column for the little newspaper in Elkater, Iowa, and so on, was still living in her own home. <clears throat> and this is an account of that visit. Pearl, Elkater, Iowa, a morning in March, the Turkey River running brown and wrinkly from a late spring snow in Minnesota. A white two-story house on Mulberry Street, windows flashing with sun. And I had come a hundred miles to tell our cousin, Pearl, that her childhood playmate, Vera, my mother, had died. I knocked and knocked at the door with its lace-covered oval of glass, and at last she came from the shadows and with one finger hooked the curtain aside, peered into my face through her spectacles, and held that pose a grainy family photograph that could have been that of her mother. I called out, Pearl, it's Ted, it's Vera's boy. And my voice broke, for it came to me nearly 60. I was still my mother's boy, that boy for the rest of my life. Pearl at 90 was one year older than mother and a widow for 20 years. She wore a pale blue cardigan buttoned over a house dress and she shook my hand in the tentative way of old women who rarely have hands to shake. When I told her that mother was gone, that she died the evening before, she said she was sorry that Vera wrote me a letter a while ago to say she wasn't good. We went to the kitchen and I sat at the table while she heated a pan of water and made us cups of instant coffee. She told me of a time when the two of them were girls and crawled out onto the porch roof to spy on my Aunt Mabel and a suitor who were swinging below. We got so excited we had to pee. <laughs> and we couldn't wait and peed right there on the roof. And it trickled down over the edge and dripped in the bushes, but Mabel and that fella never heard. We took our cups into her living room where stripes from the drawn blinds draped over the World's Fair satin pillows. She took the couch and I took a chair across from her. I've had some trouble with health myself, she said, taking off her glasses and wiping them. And I said, she looked good though. And she said, I've started seeing people who aren't here. I know they're not real, but I see them the same. They come in the house and sit around and never say a word. They keep their heads down or cover their faces with cloths. I'm not afraid, but I don't know what they want of me. You won't be able to see, but one's right there on the staircase where the light falls through that window, a man in a light gray outfit. I turned to look at the landing where a patch of light fell over the carpeted steps. Sometimes I think that my Max is with them. One seems to know his way around the house. What bothers me, Ted, is that they've started to write out lists of everything I own. They go from room to room, three or four at a time, picking up things and putting them back. I've talked to Wilson, the chiropractor, and he just says that maybe it's time for me to go to the nursing home. I asked her what her regular doctor said, and she said she didn't go there anymore, that he's not much good. But surely there's medicine, I said, and she said maybe so. And then there was a pause that filled the room. After a while, we began to talk again of other things, and there were some stories we laughed a little over, and I wept a little, and then it was time for me to go to drive the long miles back, and she slowly walked me to the door and took my hand again, our warm, bony hands among the light hands of the shadows that reached to touch us but drew back, and I cleared my throat and said I hoped she'd take care of herself and think about seeing a real medical doctor. And she said she'd give some thought to that. And I took my hand from hers and waved goodbye. And the door closed. 
and behind the lace, the others stepped out of the stripes of light and resumed their inventory, touching the spoon I used and subtracting it from the sum of the spoons in the kitchen drawer. How many people here have had experience with old people who have begun to see people like that? It's, um, the, um, it's quite common, and the medical syndrome, it's called Lewy body syndrome. It's, uh, there are some um, findings in the brain that are associated with this. Apparently, the doctor's name was Lewy. Um, she, lived, um, she lived another couple of years and did wind up in the nursing home and died in the nursing home. But surely these creatures were there to get her ready to go, get everything counted, you know, everything in its place and so on. Here's a newer poem about my father. I don't want to leave him out. My dad was a wonderful man. He, he was a, a department store manager all his life, uh, first in a very small store and then one in a shopping center. He loved people. He, um, he, he, he was a extreme extrovert. My sister's very much like him. Uh, my mother said one time to me, she said, when your dad's not talking, he's just reloading. <laughs> but um, he, had, he had sleep apnea before we knew what it was. Um, as a matter of fact, he died, uh, uh, not related to that, but he died before anybody ever as far as I know, anybody ever even identified sleep apnea, but he had it. And this is a, this is a little poem about that. Night after night, when I was a child, I woke to the guttering candle of my father's breath. It made a sound like the starlings that sometimes got caught in our chimney, a chirping that would gradually, steadily build to a desperate, flat slapping of wings, then suddenly drop into silence into the thick soot at the bottom of midnight. No silence was ever so deep. And then, after maybe a minute or two, I would hear a twitter as he came to life again, and could at last take a breath for myself, a sip like a toast, lifting a chilled glass of air, wishing us courage, those of us lying awake through those hours, my mother, my sister, and I, who each night listened to death kiss the fluttering lips of my father who slept through it all. I'm going to close with this one and then we can do some questions if you're, um, if you're interested. Um, this is a self-portrait of me. I spent a lot of my free time driving around in the countryside in Nebraska um, by myself, you know, poking into old abandoned farms and that sort of thing. And uh, one day I got to thinking, well, what do I look like to these people who see me out here? That was I. I was that older man you saw sitting in a confetti of yellow light and falling leaves on a bench at the empty horseshoe courts in Thayer, Nebraska. Brown jacket, soft cap, wiping my glasses. I had noticed, of course, that the rows of sunken horseshoe pits were like old graves, but I was not letting my mind go there. Instead, I was looking with hope to a grapevine draped over a fence in a neighboring yard and knowing that I could hold on. Yes, that was I. And that was I, the round-shouldered man you saw that afternoon in Rising City as you drove past the abandoned mini-golf, fists deep in my pockets, nose dripping, my cap pulled down against the wind as I walked the miniature main street, peering into the child-sized plywood store, the poor red school, the faded barn thinking that not even in such an abbreviated world, with no more than its little events, the snap of a grasshopper's wing against a paper cup, could a person control this life? Yes, that was I. And that was I you spotted that evening just before dark in a weedy cemetery west of Staplehurst, down on one knee, as if trying to make out the name on a stone. Some lonely old man, you thought, come there to pity himself in the reliable sadness of grass among graves. But that was not so. Instead, I had found in its perfect web a handsome black and yellow spider, pumping its legs to try to shake my footing as if I were a gift, an enormous moth that it could snare and eat. Yes, 
That was I. Thank you very much. Thank you.